Uh, now I want to introduce the next two speakers and I invite them to join us on stage. Um, first is Eleanor Aisha Holland. Um, Aisha's um, passion for calligraphy was sparked apparently when she was a teenager visiting Istanbul. Um, and after she returned back in the USA, she undertook an education in Latin lettering as well as Arabic and a path she followed that led her eventually to the master scribe, Muhammad Zakaria. Um, <clears throat> and she received an ijazah in Thuluth and Nash scripts. An ijazah is a license, for those who don't know. As a freelance lettering artist, she has exhibited her work. She has taught calligraphy, and she has done commercial and commissioned work. Her clients have included the Smithsonian Institute, the New York Public Library, Long Island University, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and the U.S. Department of State. I now want to add that Aisha is no stranger to Zaytuna College. Zaytuna College is also one of her clients. Um, she has taught students in our summer, summer Arabic intensive here, and her work currently graces our halls outside, if you see some work outside there. Um, and I have an amazing piece of her hanging on the, uh, in the wall in my office. Um, and she's back again, so we are really thrilled to have her here. So I would ask you all to join me and please welcome Eleanor Aisha Holland. <laughs> Last but not least, it's quite an honor for me to introduce our next guest, um, Abdul Latif or Ian Whiteman. Ian Whiteman is a designer, a calligrapher, a musician, and he resides in Andalusia, Spain. He studied architecture, and he performed professionally as a musician, rock music, I believe, in England in his pre-Islamic days, I think. Um, and before embarking on a career in book, graphic, and typographic design. He has been the primary print designer for Zaytuna College since its founding, and also serves as an architectural consultant currently for the Cambridge Moss that is being built in the UK. So here I must say that I had the pleasure, I've had the pleasure of working with Abdulati for the last decade or so um, on books by Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, on brochures, on a lot of the print materials you see. He originally designed the Zaytuna logo. He, I worked with him very closely on designing the Zaytuna College seal right over there that you see that is his work. Um, these banners, there's a lot of stuff you all have seen before from Zaytuna College. Abdul Latif is the creative mind behind all of those things. So he's traveled all the way from Spain to be with us today. So please give us a warm Bay Area welcome to Ian Abdul Latif Whiteman. So, okay, let's get started with this. Um, I want to start with the two of you who are practitioners of the art, of these traditional arts. You heard what Olodamini had to say. And my first question really is, he has said in this talk and his article he has written that uh, the traditional Islamic arts, this is how, you know, a beauty and <clears throat> truth are, um, is, are revealed through, re through revelation. I mean, this is, they express that, they, they embody that. So as practitioners, you both have done calligraphy, you've done all these different traditional arts. Is that how you see your work? Is that, is that go through, are you aware of this? Are you conscious of it as you're working, to, that this is what you're doing? Should we be honest? Absolutely, I want you to be honest. I mean, I saw calligraphy, like you said in my little introduction, I saw it, I thought it was beautiful, I wanted to do it. Um, I didn't think any of these philosophical thoughts of, you know, I did know that it was Arabic, I started studying Arabic. Um, I liked the fact that I was writing meaningful things and creating something beautiful, um, but it wasn't like a conscious decision. I didn't decide in advance, oh, 
this is what this represents and I think I'll do it. I just, it pulled me right to it. Like my soul was pulled to it. I saw it and I said, I want to do it. Well, of course, we don't really have time to uh, contemplate these things because like right. Aisha and myself, you, you've got a job to do and you might have three days to do it when, when, or right. in, uh, right. in Safia's case, two hours. <laughs> and uh, so uh, very often it's a case of you're just forced to produce something and actually being forced to do it produces something. Mm. And how that happens is a, an intuitive process. It's not... Uh, an intellectual process, yeah. um, and I think you'd agree. And, and, and I, th I think that what, what I was thinking while I was listening to Odenun, the, uh, the address here was that um, when I've, I've seen calligraphy or beautiful architecture or music or whatever, I've always seen the person behind it. Because mm -hmm. behind all of these things, there's always a, a big intention, there's a big motive, and whether it's a, if you walk into the, the Blue Mosque in Istanbul, what you're actually walking into is the people who built it and who they were. Um, I, so I'm going on a bit, but um, about to, well, in the 70s, I, um, I had a friend who was uh, the assistant curator of the British Library. Mm -hmm. And I went to see him, and he wanted to show me probably the most valuable manuscript in the British Library, which was a, a copy of the Ma'il uh, uh, Mus'haf. From, from Medina, so this was like 1,400 years, wow. 1,400 years old, and uh, it was brought up from the basement by a man in a brown overalls, and lifted out of a box. And when they took it out of the box, it was like, you know, I was I could barely look at it. What I was meeting was the man who wrote it, mm -hmm. it and it was not. It, well, it, obviously, when he wrote it, he wasn't thinking this is a work of Islamic art, because it's just lettering, and you probably know the know the, the book. It's on vellum, and it's big. It's about this big. It's like. No frills, no decorations, no frames. The most amazing thing was that I could actually read it. Allahu nur of summer worthy, but that's staring me in the face. And this was 40. So in a way, the man who wrote it was sort of jumped out of the box at me. So that's um, that was how I see these things. It's a, there's a human activity, not so much not an intellectual activity at all. I mean, obviously, you can you can throw uh, the Fabianacci series or the, the golden section at, at an art, it doesn't, at, at, at a project, but it doesn't make it beautiful. It could be rubbish, actually, tell you the truth. <laughs> Even though you can analyze things in that kind of way. So what, what's behind it, this is a, a, the intuitive creational moment, which you, you, you know about. Because writing calligraphy, there's a kind of a jo joy, joyous ecstasy, which you can't rationalize, it's just something. But I must interrupt to say it's not always joyous. <laughs> um, people have this notion that, you know, writing this word is, it, I mean, it is a great honor and it's a great practice, but it is hard work. Yeah, that's the technique. But you told me this morning it was joy, it was ecstatic. Did I? <laughs> but Did I, I? I want to jump in if I can. So I think that's exactly what I'm trying to say is that the, the arts take you to a kind of reality, you get that experience, that, that ecstasy, that whoa, yeah. which, which, well, not necessarily when you're working it, but when, when you saw that calligraphy, right, you were drawn mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. You say, they, they draw you in ways that, for me to do it discursively, I have to talk about all these other yeah. different things, and so art takes you there directly without having to learn, uh, you get to taste, see Islamic cosmology, philosophy, all of these things that if I want to put out, if I want to put it out discursively, it takes volumes and volumes and volumes and uh, lots of lots of intense discussion. And I think it, it's it's definitely the hal of the person, the maqam of the person mm. is in in the art, um, and uh, of, often is, is is in the art, and that jumps out at you when you're a poet. I mean, po it's most clear in poetry. If someone or with music, someone's in a particular hal or a state, and something comes out of that hal, and then hearing that or listening to it or participating, it takes you back to that that yeah. same. Or, or, or a similar, or a similar how, but I th you yeah. can. These deep things can be in in things without us being aware of it uh, mm. at at all. Oh, that's true. I just want to say you 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 two talk about you know the person who did these this piece um, manifesting through it, and I keep saying yeah, there's moments of joy. I mean, 
when you are a student of calligraphy, which every calligrapher is eternally a student, nobody ever arrives, um, there, there, it, it can be torturous. I mean, it's very hard practice. And I'll tell you, the older you get, you know, arthritis and vision problems and pain, literal pain, but, but let me finish. Um, and what I wanna say is, so people look at my pieces of work and I know what my condition was when I did it and it wasn't joyous and ecstatic. And yet people say, oh, it's so beautiful. Now I know that's the power of the word that's coming through, that's transcending, it's not just me as an individual. But I'm just, I'm a very down to earth person or I, I would like to be a down to earth person. And I just wanna say it's like for every moment when you disappear and the pen is in his hand, mm. there are 20 years of sitting and writing a letter over and over and over. I mean, as if like you're one of those kids who ke was kept for detention right. and has to write on the blackboard, you right. know, except for you're doing it every day mm -hmm. for 10 hours. So I just don't want to over romanticize. No, we, we, I, I agree with you about that. I think we, we do get your point, I think, but my question is back to Adamini, if you, does what, what she just said, does that, it, in your mind, you know, it, it almost seems to me like what she's saying is, you know, it, this is what her experience has been in creating the work. Mm -hmm. But once you create it and you put it out there, now people are experiencing and they don't know that reality of I what know. you went through, right? I know. And you were talking more about the experience of consuming that art or being a part of that art. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't call it consuming, consuming but yes, yeah. exper experiencing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. ex experiencing the art. Well, part of the, what I think the hard work of being an artist, and it is hard work, uh, the hard and why it takes such a discipline, and traditional arts especially have such an extreme discipline, um, but that's part of what leads to its great beauty. And it's, in part, it's so hard because you kind of chip away your individuality. You're, you're conforming yourself to a form. And so Islamic art, a lot of it is actually anonymous. Like we say we can kind of get a sense of the person uh, who, who did it, but you don't see someone's great works of calligraphy. You don't sign, you know, it's not like a big yes, Picasso. They do. Well, now they do, but in, in the past, in the past there weren't huge signatures. The architects of mosques are largely unknown. It's, 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 Islamic art is very, it's not a very individualistic um, art. You have individual geniuses here and there, but it's very rare when you compare it to like the history of modern art. You have, there's a, there's a kind of, um, uh, you conform yourself to the tradition and work within those bounds. And in doing that, you can, you actually have a great deal of uh, kind of freedom, but freedom in a different direction. I like to think of it as like, you know, gymnasts. These people train hard and do the same motions again and again and again. But by doing that, they have this incredible range of freedom. They can do yeah. backflips and things that none of us, norm, normal people can do. And uh, artists, especially people who practice these traditional arts, are the same kind of thing. They do these grueling exercises and training and work to be able to produce works of astounding freedom and, 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 and beauty. But that's the, I don't see the two as being mutually exclusive. I think you actually you get to that stage of freedom, beauty, transcendence, expression through the hard discipline and, and through the hard right. work. But Aisha, you get satisfaction from doing it somehow when I mean, you see these things. Or maybe I'm just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I, I think the problem is if you do it for a living, and I, being a calligrapher for a living is difficult, I know it is. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> um, Abdul Latif, I, I, I want to turn the topic a little bit to um, this idea of traditional arts and the modern world that we live in and what's happening in the societies we live in now and what impact, if anything, it's hap is having on the traditional arts. Um, and I may be putting you on the spot, Abdulatif, but I read something you wrote recently, just yesterday, um, and you wrote this, and I'm gonna read from it because it was quite, a, quite it was quite a rant. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> so you, you were talking about beauty, actually, um, and you're writing about beauty, and your opening paragraph said this, when, Mus when looking at Muslim prayer apps, and I talk about apps on the phone, the other day I could not find one which was just data, functionality, and simply displayed. All of them to different degrees were lathered with trefoils, embellishments, horseshoe arches, and geometrical borders, etc. Made much worse by a tsunami of harsh colors and graphic effects. I cannot bring myself to reproduce any examples here. It is symptomatic of a malaise which has infested our lives, which is how modernity has strangled tradition, 
and which has filtered into the creation and the design of many types of things and made a nonsense of it all and idiots of all of us. It's become a cut and paste effects culture and I don't see quite where it will end except into some kind of chaotic soup. <laughs> Tell us what you really think. Yeah. You've got a round of applause so it can't be that bad. <laughs> Well, it's true, you know, there's this idea that you can strap on beauty or you can strap on Islamic art. I'm faced with it all the time, you know. The thing is, actually, if you look at something like this, which, would you, it's, it's, it's Islamic art, I don't know what it is. For me, it's just a typographic exercise. Uh, and it's, you know, you make it look as beautiful as you can. You call it Islamic, I don't, I don't know, but it's... Uh, um. But this idea that, that modern, modernity is sort of strangling, as you said, traditional arts. Tell me, how you know, my, does that my, play out? What, ha what have you seen? What, you what know, my, my ideas about modernity change. I, I, you know, I studied for five years in the mecca of modern, modern architecture in London, from Buckminster Fuller to Norman Foster, the, you know, everybody. And one of the biggest problems is I didn't really understand it. There was a, it was like a religion. You, they told you what you had to like, whether it was Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe. And, you know, it's what turned me into sort of basically into a rock musician. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, that led to me eventually ending up in the Jamia Situna Mosque in Meknes. And I walked inside it and sat down, and it was like, suddenly I didn't have to think. I suddenly understood it. No one's telling me what to think and what to like. Um, and, uh, you know, about 10 years ago, I had to go to a, a seminar in London, which was about spiritual spaces in urban environments. And it was on the subject of principally mosques, but also churches, meditation spaces. And there was a Spanish architect who presented this uh, enormous mosque in North London, which mostly was never built. It was, I think, about 50,000 worshippers. And it was in, the, in the, the style of Zaha Hadid, if you know who Zaha Hadid was. Yeah. It was great swooping roofs, no visible columns, lots of glass. And everyone was very curious. And this woman stood up in the audience and said, excuse me, I won't use this, give his name, but he said, excuse me, but I don't understand it. And to me, that was the most profound, profound observation. And it, it stuck with me. And you know, I think that architects, you know, the, the, the modern architect, principally, has got out of hand. And also, they've just completely underestimated the perspicacity of the ordinary person. Mm. You know, the, everybody out here kind of knows when it's something's beautiful. It's instinctive in us, as, as uh, what is everybody saying? But it's um, kind of been taken away. We've been told what to like. We've been told to. You know, probably by repeating something often enough, you, you'll say, well, I agree. You know, this is principle of advertising. Right. You know, if you do it often enough, you say, oh, okay, fine, I'll buy it. And I think a lot of the ideas about modernity... On the other hand, you see, modernity was... Uh, um, the modern movement, particularly in architecture, was actually kind of liberation for people. And I can see why, because from the, from the, from the belle époque of the French, you know, and the, 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 the Victorian um, eclecticism and things, it was complete muddle. And sometimes it was very good, but mm -hmm. people wanted to be free of that. Okay, the, mod the mod modern movement came out of the Russian Revolution, the French Revolution, and, so, and people were sick of the old order. But then it kind of went foul. It was supposed mm -hmm. to be function follows, form follows function. It's a Walter Gropius. And there were good things, that, you know, it's the things I really liked, but it wasn't going to go anywhere. And the architects became more and more egregiously kind of egotistic until you have like the London landscape now, it's like full of gherkins and cucumbers and shards and it's like, this, this is, the, this is, what, this is the, the model of, of the modern uh, architect. They've made a model of themselves. Right. Uh, Frank Geary. Uh, you think it's exciting and people like it, but it's actually, it doesn't, it's not satisfying. They've, in, in other words, they don't understand it. I don't understand it. But do you think it also means that that kind of architecture will not last the way some of the people well, it's, it's enough concrete, it'll last for a long time. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think people are kind of tired of it, you know. But particularly mosque design, which I've been involved in quite a few. It is a problem because people, you know, as I was telling, uh, talking earlier, that calligraphy is alive and well, you know, Zilij is alive and well, Ebru is alive and well, all this mm -hmm. stuff. But with architecture, you have a big, big problem. Because all of these different things, these strands come together in architecture. And why it's a complete mess, you know. How often have you seen... But when you talk to people about mosques, they actually don't know what they want. They don't know what you say, well, what kind of mosque would you like? What is a mosque? You know, these architects who consulted me about mosques would say, well, 
where does it say in the Quran how to build a mosque? You know, and I said, actually, nowhere. Because initially, it was just a piece of ground with a wall around it. Right. Um, so we've got to get rid of, we've got to throw out some of these kind of preconceptions about what things are, but still hold on to tradition. Not traditionalism, but tradition. Because we need tradition to be able to understand things. I mean, we are traditional beings. We've got the hands of Adam, the heads of Adam. So we're, we are traditional. So you can't abandon tradition. But it's, it's just got to be free of the... Um, sort of total preconceptions, of, particularly about Islamic art, because people think, as I said earlier, you can, they think you can strap it on something. You can't. It's the process of who the person is, how he does it, what it is. You know, it's a, um, that's what's been lost. It's all got kind of mental. <laughs> um, Aisha, let me ask you that about, about the same point about calligraphy, for instance. I mean, there's calligraphy, there's traditional calligraphy, but is it something that you, is it very restrictive in your mind, what you have to do, there's certain boundaries you don't cross, or can people today be creative and start to do some their own version of lettering? In well, I'm not going to tell people what they can't and can do, but... Um, as in almost any, well, I'm thinking of the Latin uh, calligraphy world, those people who were doing the most innovative, interesting, new forms of calligraphy have all studied the classical forms. They've all gone to the Trajan column and done these Roman letter forms and gone through the historical. And it's like saying, um, as has been said, that you know you you learn all these forms and the tradition, and you build up a technique, and then you can fly. So, I, and I'm glad you said this. The world of calligraphy is alive and well and expanding. I mean, maybe not in the United States or in North America yet, but you know, in, with our partnership, it will. <laughs> um, but Inshallah. calligraphy is extremely popular now in the Muslim world, and there are many teachers who are teaching this classical curriculum that goes back a thousand years and students are struggling away with it and the you know arts of illumination and marbling and I would say all of that is alive and well and I would say there is um, some innovation happening and so some people are taking classical letter forms and applying them in different ways um, to me, that's great. And there are, there's even at least one individual I know who's designing or developing a new style of writing. Um, you know, these styles of calligraphy developed through the human hand. They weren't, they didn't come down specifically. And so it takes sort of some generations you know, of reflection by stu people who are doing calligraphy for a hand to kind of ripen and develop and become what it's going to be. So um, I think it's alive and vibrant and I really think we need more education about calligraphy because that could help to overcome a lot of this. I think that, I think that Arabic is the, the key the, and the Quran, the revelation is the key to it all actually because that's the thing that runs through all of the especially in, in finding out with architecture, of course. Um, but I think this thing of uh, the, the traditionally most practices of some art or craft have modeled their work on someone else's. Mm -hmm. This is what everybody always did. If you were Chinese and you mm -hmm. wanted to build a mosque, you built it like a pagoda, because that's what you did. That's what a, a spiritual space was, any mm -hmm. building was. This is what the, the Ottomans did. They took the Hagia Sophia and they put minarets on the corner. It's a, it's a, worship, a worshipping space, it's, it's, it's constructionally possible. And we all do it. I mean, I, I thieve stuff all the time, but I change it and make it my own. And that's, that's completely legitimate. I think the modern, modern idea is of originality and individualism is what kills it. You know, there's nothing wrong with copying something that someone else has done, because when you do it, it's, it's unique, even if it looks right. exactly the same. You make it your own. Yeah, yeah. you make it your yeah. own. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to right. quickly add, so the, um, the calligraphic art forms, in particular scripts, develop over time. But what's fascinating is Islamic calligraphy, the calligraphy, the Arabic language itself, seems to emerge, like to almost descend with the revelation. Before mm -hmm. Islam, you had some Nabataean script, and the Arabic was written, but it was written, it's not very beautiful, it's not very geometric. No. Literally, at two generations uh, mm -hmm. after, within like 100 years, you get this whole calligraphic art. Fully, it's it's incredible. Uh, it's but really initially, well, they weren't self-conscious though. Yeah, they no, no, just, they it just, just wanted it to just, write this they thing just, down. It, but yeah. it, 
when your soul and your mind and your worldview are shaped by the Quran so yeah. strongly, what comes out has all of these subtle mm -hmm. connections, even if you're not aware of it at all. Same thing like when you talk about the, the mosques in West Africa in general. Yeah, yeah, They're very, very similar to uh, pre-Islamic houses and yeah. places, places of worship, but they're different in many ways. In fact, I know someone who was trying to reconstruct, get an idea of the Prophet's mosque in Medina, and he came to Mali to look at because they have sand floors and mud bricks and tree columns uh, and things like that. So they, they took these forms that were already there, the kind of materia prima, and then imposed this uh, Islamic archetype on them. And it turned to look, the mosque in Jenei looks so different from a mosque in China it looks so different from a mosque in Egypt, but like Ibn Battuta said, when you enter any of those spaces, you feel at home. You mm -hmm. feel a similar presence there, which is it's really remarkable, and I, I think can only be explained by this kind of vertical dimension. But I, th you know, uh, I know, one of the most incredible mosques that I know of was actually, I don't know if it's still there, it's in a shanty town in McNess, yeah. which was actually just built of corrugated iron. Yeah. And this was one of the f most favored places of the, the sheikhs and the ulama. And there was nothing kind of uh, Islamic about it at all. But the people, you know, but what was Islamic, if you like? It was the people. people the barakah. The, the barakah. Yeah. And I think this thing of um, what I was saying earlier about the people, the person behind the, the script, actually something is imbued in the things that you do. If something, Aisha writes something, she is in that. And, mm -hmm. and you know, modern science talks about, you know, um, the memory of matter. Mm -hmm. Rupert Sheldrake is talking about the conscious universe. I mean, it, it's, it, you know, it's not just dead matter. Your calligraphy is alive with you, with what, you with what you've put into it. It may be an agony for you, but it's, maybe it's lovely for someone else. <laughs> but it, you can't, you know, it's not, it's not, you're not separate from it. And why you, something that could be a thousand years old is, is alive. But you can also, converse it, you could have a piece of beautiful looking calligraphy that could be absolutely dead flat and lifeless because maybe of the person who did it. Which is why, you know, the, 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 the poster, the photograph, you know, the simulacrum of the original doesn't really fly. Would you agree? I've done posters and I, I don't like the posters and things I've done. <laughs> I think there is a, um, a renovatio going on with people doing stuff by hand. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. in general, a lot of it may be sort of kitschy stuff that we're not thrilled about. But on the other hand, like just calligraphy in general, Latin and Arabic script, there's a lot of people out there who want to do this. I guess it's the hipster. You're talking about in the Arab world or in the... No, I'm talking about like in New York. Oh, right. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm living... Because the kitsch stuff in the, in the Gulf sells for huge amounts of money. Okay, <laughs> I'm not talking about that kind of stuff. can't sell this stuff at all. No, I'm just saying that people who... Um, a lot of young people, these millennials... Um, millennials? ...are now appreciating things made by hand, doing things by hand, cooking. I mean, you know, I know they're br brewing beer. I'm not doing that, but and I'm not supporting that, but... Studying calligraphy, studying a lot of different kind of yeah. crafts and arts that you do by your hand. And that's something that we need kind of another, like the arts and crafts movement. Mm -hmm. Kind of the Islamic world needs that. And it may be happening now. This is, you know, like we're all looking at stuff. Yeah. We're just li living our small lives. So, but this is, well, this may be happening on some level. You know, I was talking to you earlier about this. So I had to give a class on music and Islam to these people a few years ago in, in, the, in Livermore in the Bay Area. And these students were like consumers because I said to them, first of all, do you know what a cassette is? And there were 50 students between the age of 18 and 30. And they said, no, what's a cassette? I thought, oh, generational problem here. So we MP3s, they you know what MP3s were. But then I said to them, who plays the musical instrument here? One person put their hand up, I have 50 students. I said, well, what's the instrument? He said, bagpipes. <laughs> okay. it was, uh, and I realized that they were consumers of music. They didn't recreate it. Recreation means recreating it. In, in, when I grew up, every house in, in England, probably in Europe, had a piano in it. And probably musical instruments, a banjo or a violin or something. If you go to those same rooms now, there'll be a gigantic television and sofas. It looks like an Ikea showroom. And, and which people just sit and consume like couch potatoes, whatever they're fed. And it's a kind of tragedy. You know, when I grew up, it was nothing but playing music and doing it. It was, it was just normal, and that's, that's been lost. I want to talk, since you mentioned music, let's talk about music for a minute, because um, I think you have done a lot of different kinds of music, but you also um, were involved with the recording of the Burda. 
by, by the Fez singers in Morocco with um, Sheikh Hamza, right? Correct. And so you've done that. Um, my question is, and you've done, you know, you're very familiar with rock music. You're familiar with the different kinds of music. And this is broader than music, but I want to use music as a way to talk about it, which is, is this idea of an Islamic art and not Islamic art, right? I mean, we get into definitions and we'll talk about that as well, but I want to understand, like, is the music of, you know, for instance, is the music of Yusuf Islam or is the poetry of uh, Amir Suleiman, who's here, you know, people, these are popular people. Is that Islamic art or is that not? I think you could probably say more on that. Actually. So, if you have a definition, you define Islamic arts as in a certain way. Can you just share that with us in, in the context of what I'm talking about? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said in the talk, and it's not just me, it's several other, Seyed Hossein Nasser, Titus Burkhardt, a uh, bunch of other scholars. Islamic arts, its form and structure emerges from the Islamic revelation and from the Islamic worldview. So, poetry, for example, you can look at anywhere Muslims uh, went. Uh, Poetry, a particular kind of poetry, entered that language and usually became the best poetry in that language. So Sindhi, Javanese, Malay, Hausa, all these different languages produced volumes of beautiful Islamic poetry, but it all has meter and rhyme. And the meters might be different from the Arabic meters, but it all had meter and rhyme and had a certain kind of poetic style to it. And there are different styles, even within the same language. It was like a, uh, an Indian style of Persian, poetry and then the Persian style and Timurid and all these different sub-styles. But there's a kind of, you can pick up a book of Islamic poetry um, in any language that you know and you're in the, same, in the same kind of world. You're playing the same game, they're using the same kinds of metaphors, images from the Quran with some local variations. And, but it's in, uh, the important thing in terms of form for poetry is, is the meter and rhyme and the polyvocal nature of what they're saying. You're always saying three or four things at once and speaking in, mm. in, in symbols. Um, and you see this everywhere Muslims went. And so someone like Amir Suleiman, actually I really like what he's doing because he's also working in meter and in rhyme. Mm -hmm. And he's speaking uh, very, uh, some of the things he, uh, he's um, written or his spoken word pieces, if you translated them into Arabic and you move things around a little bit, and I showed it to someone, they'd be like, oh, this, is this a 17th century Moroccan uh, poet? Wow. Um, you know, you'd have to move a few things around, but I, I think some of the things that, uh, that, that he's doing, that the poetry of it uh, is, is definitely Islamic because you can feel the, uh, and see and hear the, the impact of the Islamic revelation in both the form um, and, and the content. Um, and that's very clear in traditional Islamic music. It uh, changes uh, over time. Uh, from, from place to place, but there's the certain traditional, especially the vocal styles, it's very, very clear and very close. It's like an echo of the Quran. Uh, like I said, these, these vocal, especially the vocal styles of music. And even today, the best pop singers all train in Tajweed in the Arab world. Even the pop music, which I wouldn't, I'd be hesitant to classify as Islamic or kind of borderline cases. Um, the rhythms, you know, come from traditional uh, sources, but, the, um, but all of the best singers train in Tajweed. All of the best pop singers. Train in touch with. There's a connection which, in which country? Hmm? Which country? Egypt, Morocco, Kuwait, everywhere. Uh -huh. um, so the, there's there's a connection, uh, even if they're singing about nonsense stuff. There's a connection between I, the form of, of the art. I and, think it, and needs the Islamic made, revelation. it needs to be made clear though that there's actually it's a kind of like many different str strata of. Yes, of there music. are many different I'm strata. Put the, you know, the, the highest is obviously below the Quranic recitation, is actual invocation yes and to sing, which is 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 actually a spiritual practice but then you come down you have poetry mm -hmm. like which is about islam mm -hmm. and that's what interests me and then and you come down until you're down sort of military music and military so and forth folk music and, and i think music. in these times um i'm very suspicious of like you know the, the islamic boy band phenomena oh yeah i know, no, I know no, you are as well I, I, yeah. yeah well <laughs> i've known some of them in ray Hahn, for instance who i actually did some recording with years ago they were so slick and they were so good. They were like the, the Malaysian Beach Boys. Right. And uh, they're very nice people, but it was, yes. uh, it was actually all about the spreadsheet. Exactly. And the fact that they were Warner Brothers' biggest selling act. Exactly. You know, east of um, Kuwait. <laughs> but um, with, you were talking about Yusuf Islam because, you know, he went back to playing the guitar and he's, he's a, you know, he's kind of genius uh, songwriter. And he's, I can see he's been trying to get back to something s not sort of mental about 
religion, but just reaches pretty from his heart, and he's better at that than trying to do something religious. And I think what we need now in the, in the sort of music, the music world, forget the higher stuff, because that hasn't changed in, in a, thousand, a thousand years, but I, I, is really poetry that's like really real and deep. Yes. And, and, and yeah. we need experts in that because, you know, there's a famous, uh, there's a famous hymn called Amaz Amazing Grace, which everybody knows. Mm -hmm. And interesting, that was actually started off as a poem written by a, 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 a curate called John Norton, who was actually in this, a, a slave trader. And he, he was in a boat that, that capsized off Ireland. And, and as a sort of penance, he wrote this poem. Hmm. And, and it, then people started to put music to it. And it was, I think there's 20 different tunes to it, you know. Mm -hmm. But it, it's, it's kind of universal, you know. It, it doesn't, you don't cringe when you, exactly. you, can, you can hear songs people sing about, you know, about our prophet. And, and you, you, don't. you kind of cringe because of what's in it. It's just the content. It has to be so subtle if you're writing about these things in, in English. It's not like Arabic. English no. is so different. You have yes. to. It, it, we need sort of genius poets, you know, who can subtly talk about these things. And when you've got that, you'll get the music. You can't do it the other way around. You can't think of the music and stick and stick. I mean, you can. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, I, I want to. Yeah, the. the I, I would define. Should, so uh, there are a couple definitions of Islamic art here. So I, in the article, I try to make this differentiation between uh, sacred arts, which are those directly central to the practice of Islam, recitation of Quran, dhikr, uh, in, invocation, sam'a, some of these, which are directly uh, related to, to the practice of Islam, and then traditional uh, Islamic arts, which might not be central to the practice and are necessarily the highest art forms, but are still informed by this on a very deep, uh, deep level. So you'll have um, a, a lot of folk music, for example, Moroccan folk music, or these, these things like that, that are deeply informed by, uh, even if the artists themselves aren't, aren't aware of it, mm -hmm. uh, in Islamic cosmology, understanding of music, time, number, uh, et cetera, that maintains uh, some of those things. And conversely, you can have religious music, which is music that people are singing about the prophets or Islam or about God or about Ramadan or something like that. That's completely, the form is completely un-Islamic. Has, has more in common with Backstreet Boys than with, uh, with than, than anything else. Um, and so just, just meter and rhyme for poetry is not enough. I mean, English, uh, we think now that European languages got their meter and rhyme from the Arabic uh, tradition. And there's loads of interesting poetry written in English that I wouldn't classify well, as, as no, Islamic, even think, if it has meter and rhyme. Oh, I want to ask you, can you, see, can you imagine seeing the, can you see the burda being done in English? No. Why not? You caught me there. Um. Well, for a start, I didn't really understand it in Arabic because it's very sophisticated Arabic. I can read the translation. You know, I, I'm kind of like half and half with this because um, I can appreciate people singing the Bordava. Mm -hmm. uh, because, it's, but I have to sort of then read the translation. Um, in that sense, I'm sort of detached from it. And I, 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 but to then put that into English, I mean, we've known people try to do Qasidas, translating them into English, and it just doesn't work. To, to, I think it's really to have the Buddha in English, we need to have a saint who has a vision of the prophets so or yes, Islam exactly. who gives him. No, honestly, that's no, I mean, that's, that's yeah, how okay. that's how that's, the, what I mean. that's that's how these arts came to be. In the, the, the greatest the greatest poets or the greatest poet in Malay language, Hamza Fansuri, is a great Sufi. Sheikh, a lot of these greatest poets, there's a kind of inspired quality to the poetry, yeah. and they were able to translate that into the form we of the language. We need English poets who so have, have vision in that sense. Basically, <laughs> if, if, if you want to trans, quote unquote, translate the, the Buddha into English, you can't just go yeah, you translate can't, you can't it with Hans Weir dictionary and yeah. then try to make it rhyme and be in meter. That's not going to work. Have tried that what, thing, you, yeah. what you need is you need to have someone who has a direct experience of, or with the Prophet and who is able then to convey that mm. through inspiration, through I mean, technical sure skill. Happen into a uh, beautiful English verse. That's the only way. And that's actually kind of the, one of the signs of the maturity of an Islamic community is what are their mm -hmm. poems for the Prophet? So you see this very quickly as Islamic societies mature over time, different places, Islam spread various places, usually very soon within uh, two or three generations, about a hundred years, you start getting poems for the Prophet in that language popping up. And I that's a kind that of sign it, of the maturity you know, of the community. It's, it'll take it, that it's long. A, it, you know, no, it's an important question because the reality, as we know, is that what last time I heard was less than 10% of Muslims speak and understand Arabic very well. Right. So now, how do we make this some, something like the border or anything else that's, you know, understood by a lot more people? If you're saying that that can, you know, I'm just throwing out a question about what would it take 
to make all of this because the idea, and you quoted Dr. Sayed and Nasser, and I want to say this, the talk that he gave a few years ago at RIS on metaphysics, one of the key things that I took from that is that he said, the way metaphysics and traditional societies filtered down to people was through the culture, through the arts, through poetry, through song, right? That's how the common person got to understand the metaphysical element, right. the unseen. What will it take today for that to happen? We need saints who are artists. I mean, yeah, basically that's, I mean, Rumi didn't write the, sit down and be like, okay, I'm gonna introduce people to uh, the depths of the realities of the Quran and the religion in, uh, in a simple Persian. He was Rumi. And because he was Rumi, he was inspired, and this inspiration yeah. came out. Hafez, Yunus Emre, all these other great uh, poets and the figures who were really the, the people who made the culture, the culture makers of the Islamic world, most of them were very, very serious spiritual uh, people who had access, direct access to these higher realities and were thus able to, when inspiration struck them, put them into, into tangible forms. I mean, you also have people who were just very technically skilled, like Mutanabi, Abu Nawas, guys who are kind of like contemporary rappers. They're amazing with language and they rap, you know, they talk about all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, but there's something very different uh, about the, the work of a Rumi, of an Ibn al-Farid, uh, to, to, so that's, to, to do that in America, to do that with the English speaking audience, we need uh, realized people who are artists. People who, who are working on the greatest art, which is the art of the cultivation of the soul. And then out of beautifying the soul, the external beauties of art come. Aisha, you know, you've done not just Arabic calligraphy, but you do English lettering, you've done Latin. Do you see a difference in the way you do those things? Is there a difference in how you approach it? Is there a difference in what you think you infuse it with meaning? I mean, how, how do you see that? Is there a difference? Um, uh, not so much in my personal approach. I mean, I always approach anything I'm gonna do that I wanna do it the best I can and that I need to develop, um, I don't know if anybody here is gonna understand this, you need to trigger your flow. <laughs> Maybe you understand this. Um, yeah, I probably sound like a nut. Um, you just um, sound, no, try it. You just, it just sounds very American, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> I, I am an American, actually. I am that's an American, American. <laughs> yeah. Trigger can't, my I can't, flow. I <laughs> can't deny it, I cannot deny it. Um, but what I'm doing when I'm doing a piece of anything is I have to find the right tool, the right ink, the right paper. I have to get the flow going on something. Mm -hmm. And these are things, I mean, this is just my, this is very personal that I'm sharing with all these people. Um, I can't quantify that. Yeah. So I don't know how long it's gonna take, I don't know how it's gonna be, different things can arise over time, but between, I mean, Sometimes I'm addressing envelopes in English, and that has, I'm still doing that flow, flow check, you know, mm -hmm. and getting it going. Um, what I like about repetitive work like that is that it frees my mind. And my mind, once I kind of get set, is free to think about things and three, free to occasionally glance out the window at the beauty of the world, which is God's creation. Um, I would say Arabic is always more of a challenge, technically. It just, there's a lot more variation, there's a lot more options um, in terms of creating a composition. And so you have to kind of dig deeper. Would you, say, would you say because Ar Arabic is not your natural language, your native language, that by doing something in English, you have a more of a, uh, it triggers your flow better? <laughs> Um, because I you're, you're actually understanding the meaning, it's more spontaneously. I think Latin script is a lot easier to write than Arabic letters. Yeah, That's agree. really what I think. So yeah, it's, I, I definitely know what I'm saying. But the fact is, is that the process that I do, I'm not like sitting there thinking about each yeah, yeah. word. I'm thinking about the whole phrase, whatever well, I'm I, doing. I have, to, I have to put an ad in here for Aisha because there's a, there's a beautiful piece of Arabic if she's she's done, which is in, uh, I think it's an ayat, isn't it? With a gold, so I, yeah. a gold, and with the English around it, and I thought, yeah, that's right, because it's actually gonna hit people what it means, right. as well as looking at the Arabic, which they don't understand, but right. are still, as you were saying, you know, it emotionally affects you. Right, um, right. You should, you should pursue that, you've got a future there. 
Inshallah, that would be no, nice. I, I've, been, I've, I've told her this for a long, many, on, on I many know, times. many people have told me that. Many people, because not everybody understands Arabic. This is clearly. the point, yeah. And the fact is, what I am always amazed about, about when I present anything done in Arabic, is that all kinds of people come and look at art, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Everybody comes and looks at art. And so many people see this and they don't even know what it is. Some people don't know what language it is. Yes. And they say, wow, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And then you explain to them what it is. And some people are kind of amazed because of what they think of what Muslims are, all these preconceived ideas. Um, but also then when you get to tell people those lines and that energy on the page mean something. Hmm. And I mean, the fact is, is that when I sit down to do a composition in any language, I'm not doing like my grocery list, <laughs> you know, with pen and ink. I'm doing something that has some meaning to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think are the uh, challenges in, <coughs> in today's society of, of creating tra traditional art? Not, you know, what, what, because I'm trying to get with the language was one issue I was trying to get at, but I'm trying to understand what are the restrictions, what are the limitations in trying to do traditional art today for people in different fields and artists. I mean, should I let the two people who actually do this for a living? No, I want, I want to hear from all three of you. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so uh, on speaking from kind of more uh, my position as an outsider, uh, looking in a bit more, I think one of the biggest challenges is if, if you grew up in, let's say, pre-colonial fairs, everything you saw pretty much was either direct art of nature or Islamic art. That's all that you saw. And so your kind of diet, the building blocks that you drew on, your, your toolkit in your imagination had a kind of cohesiveness to it. Um, as uh, Abdul Latif was, was talking about, now uh, things are, our imaginary uh, diet the, of forms and things that we take in is so, it's diverse isn't the right word, it's really cacophonous, um, fractured, it's a bricolage uh, of everything. So, and that requires a great deal of discernment for anyone trying to make beauty and discernible art. Some, just a, a Moroccan kid growing up, if he was to do calligraphy or design a house, he couldn't help but design something beautiful because mm. all he had ever seen were beautiful things. Now, you have to have a lot of discernment because people are telling you, okay, this wavy, crazy uh, spindle, that's beautiful. And you're but like, do, oh, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel But do you think that's me. because the general public had a kind of collective understanding I of think, what, what was beautiful? I think it works both ways. The general oh. public had a collective understanding of what was beautiful, in part because they were growing up in beautiful surroundings mm. and because they had an understanding of what was beautiful. They only wanted beautiful things. So they mm. had taste, and their taste was informed by their beautiful surroundings. So, so, uh, I mean, nice, do, do, nice you think, do you think that if a, per loop? if a person is actually really out of harmony or ill, that in fact they perceive things in an ugly fashion? I, uh, I, I, mean, I, I think, well, I think what, what can happen, and this is why like death metal is popular, there's a kind of disharmony yeah. uh, within you, a malaise, and then you either seek out or identify, mm -hmm. resonate with things that have a mm -hmm. similar kind of malaise. I, I, I mention this because I know that um, voice coaches yeah. Uh, very interesting, they can actually take someone who is tone deaf yeah. and make them pitch perfect, but it's not a psychological process. What they do is they make them healthy. They right. do breathing, breathing exercises to strengthen their lungs. Right. Like, <coughs> this is a, a traditional voice coach and it strengthens the, the heart and the lungs. Right. And um, when, when a person is that in kind of harmony, then they can actually sing in, in tune. Because when people are actually out of tune, they can't sing in tune. They can't even play rhythm. I've seen it. Yep. People, they, when someone's out of harmony, they can't keep a rhythm properly. Yep. I, I think but I, when people are naturally in, in harmony, they can keep the time, they can sing in tune. And as I, many Moroccans. Yeah, can do. And I think that the same, just as people, uh, that's true on a physical level, it's even more true on a psychological level, it's even more true on a spiritual level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that kind of uh, that wholeness, health, spiritually, psychologically, physically, the, the expressions that come out of that are also uh, healthy. Are as, also as a lot of people are saying now, you know, people don't sing as much as they used to. I mean, people grew up in yeah, churches singing, and yeah. uh, they, they used to, uh, someone was saying to me yesterday, they went on a, on a march, it was the, well, an anti-Trump march in New York. This was l l last night with the Richard Thompson, this musician. And he said, no one was singing. You know, people used to go on these marches and say, we shall overcome, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> But it's like just sort of marched with sort of protest. All right, well, I'll go out and um, start leading we, we, them. We went to, I, went on this, the, <laughs> I, went, I went on the Million Man March in, yeah. for the Iraq War in London, and it was a bit the same, and then someone started singing, war, 
What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. And there must have been about 100 people singing in the end, and it was, had this unifying effect. The point exactly. is that we're using their voices. And, and people have... Um, you know, um, on this point, you make an interesting point in your article. I mean, you, you talk about the effect of music, and you give an example, I think, of uh, the music that soldiers and people and violent people listen to to get themselves yes. in that state of yes. violence. Mm -hmm. And they don't... They're not going to listen to, as you said, the classical Indian music of Ali Akbar Khan. Mm -hmm. They're going to listen to some metal band or whatever, you know, some kind of discordant music, right? Exactly. But music is just so powerful. This is the no, that's, that's the point, exactly, I mean, right? It, that's why it's used, it was used <laughs> in martial music, was to, yeah. you know, beating drums to get them to fight. And you heard the bagpipes coming, you know, you were mm -hmm. scared. I mean, you're talking about the difficulty in doing traditional arts today is because in one way to put it, there's too much white noise out there to separate, to be able to clear your mind to actually focus on something. But the other part is, as a result of that, if people are producing that kind of art all the time, then that's infecting others, right? Yes, it can be a negative, just like there's a positive, there can be a positive feedback. Right. There can also be a, a negative uh, Exactly. A negative feedback. And so what I want to <laughs> say is, I want to like tell everybody out there, you know, here's my message to the universe. Islamic arts, at least the graphic arts, calligraphy, uh, illumination, you know, in Arabic it's called zakhrafa. Um, Ebru, paper marbling, these are alive and thriving. And so, you know, find your local teacher or get yourself to Istanbul. Do it. Um, you know, like yes. it is possible to, to study these arts. Mm -hmm. And what it takes, which is something that I think has sort of waned in our culture globally, is a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that you just go and have a few lessons. And especially, there's something about calligraphy. Like, you know, whenever I teach any kind of class, I always say, how many people out here know how to write? And you know, everybody raises their hand and I say, okay, now you don't. Like, and you have to wipe clean what's all these images that are in the back of your mind in any script. Sometimes people who don't know Arabic do an incredibly amazing job studying these new Arabic letter forms. But anyway, it's, it's possible, and I mean, a lot of people who are maybe out there listening to heavy metal, right, in Brooklyn, oh, yeah. um, come to a class, and they really, like, lap it up and yep. love it. So, yep. like, I'm not very quick to judge people um, in this mm -hmm. area because I think people respond to beauty, all kinds of people, and I don't want to just say, oh, you know, the modern world has destroyed the appreciation of beauty. No, it's, it's in there. And all kinds of strange characters yeah. come out of the woodwork for different reasons. Yeah. Some that they just want to use their hand. Right. They want to craft something. Do you think so, tagging was kind of related to clear? Oh, no, I, graffiti I actually, actually is do, absolutely a lettering is deep, art. Deeply related. But I, I'm, so I want to be clear, clear here. I'm not judging the people at all. I'm judging the art. I'm not judging the people at all. I'm, I'm judging the, the particular uh, art forms based on certain aesthetic uh, criteria. And I agree, the same thing that might make someone uh, you know, headbang to metal music for hours on and will draw them to your calligraphy class, that same longing uh, for, right. for peace, for, for beauty, for beauty right. will, will right. draw them to the calligraphy. But I think what the difference is, is <laughs> you can, it's like eating fast food versus a home cooked meal. You're, you're hungry, you go for both. Right, but the one that's going to satisfy you and uh, improve yeah. your health is the home cooked meal. And unfortunately, and so that's and so that's um, that's the distinction uh, I want to draw. And I think it's important that um, parents encourage that. Like a lot of parents, I was growing up, I had to I had to take piano lessons. I had, then whether I wanted to do or not, I had to take piano lessons, and I had to do a little bit of calligraphy uh, as well too. I think parents can play a huge role in sustaining the Islamic arts. Make your kids do some form of Islamic art, whether it's do calligraphy lessons, or learn maqams, or any of these different things. It, because when you're exposed to it at, at a young age, you start to, and you start to develop it, it teaches discipline, and there's a kind of baraka in actually uh, doing it. Not just um, uh, being surrounded by it, which is great, but in also producing it, right. it can really be a profoundly transformative uh, experience. I wanna, um, we've been talking among ourselves a lot. Let me see if there's any people who want to ask questions. If you have questions, please come up to the microphone. And people online, if they have questions, send them in, and we'll try and take some questions from the audience now. 
Um, so in contemporary times, like, you know, a lot of art is digitally produced. And um, yeah, so my question is, what do you think is the impact of such an art um, on the individuals who are experiencing the art and who are producing that art? Abdul Latif, fully understand the there, there's a lot of um, music being produced digitally. Art, music. No, well, music and, and other art digitally produced. So the question is, you know, how do you understand that both for people who are producing it, but also for people who can, you know, listening to it it's or entirely watching? Entirely digitally produced. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know what to say to that actually. Um, I can say something about it. Um, I think. The difference between something that's digitally produced and that's produced with your hand is a profound experiential difference. When yeah. you use your hand to do something, you have a direct connection. And people who are now promoting handwriting for young kids taking yeah. notes talk about that it engages parts of your brain. And so you remember much more. Yeah. I mean, when you're, I mean, I'm just, because I'm a calligrapher, that's what I do. You know, it may appear that I'm sitting there and just moving my arm and my shoulder, but I'm actually using my whole body. In fact, what I personally like about calligraphy is you're using your head and your heart and your hands. And so it, it kind of creates a unity. But when you're doing things digitally, it... What do you, actually, what do you mean by digitally? I mean, it's a... You mean on a computer, right? Yeah. Okay. I mean... People say to me, oh, you could create the Kufic calligraphy digitally. But you, you mean know. actually in a, in a program? Or in a program, in... Um, because I've, I've taken several of the things... Illustrator. I've taken several of the things you've uh, done by hand and no, I've but, put them into... Right, you know. but, and so that's fine. I mean, I often... You have to produce stuff that's going to be digitized. You, you scan it and whatever. Yeah. And you scan it and whatever. But actually creating something... Yeah. I think yeah. the you, question is more about creating something digitally, not transferring something that's already done right, into digi right. or digitizing it. So the difference is, is that it's going to be better when you do it by your hand, with your hand, because it's more engaging of your whole being. And when you're just doing it, putting little pins down and drawing lines to connect them on a screen. You're probably right, but you see the Taj Deed, it says that little square logo thing. Yes. It's entirely created in InDesign. Right, right. <laughs> but I think as I could do it by ink, it's just easier to do it. That well, so I, I think part of I this... I would even argue that's not, that's lettering, that's not even calligraphy. And it's... How dare you? <laughs> I think, well, we can get into some I, new debates. I think the, the, the real answer to your question kind of lies in, in your worldview and uh, your, your cosmology. So Baraka is something real. Um, and I think we've all experienced with handmade anything. You have a hand-woven carpet versus a machine-woven yeah, carpet. Handmade fabric or embroidery versus a print. Um, there's a difference yeah. there. And, and, and you feel, or do you see those stone walls where the stones are all kind of put together, uh, or bricked walls, or the bricks are laid by hand. There's a difference yeah. there. Or even uh, they've found with electronic music, uh, having a drum beat where people are actually playing the drums by hand is more pleasing to the ear than you have that same drum sound that they take and electronically put it. It's, there's a human presence, there's a baraka uh, in that that's absent in uh, the thing that's just uh, there's dig depth. digitally. There's more depth, there's a humanity in there, there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a presence, there's a baraka there that I think most people are still sensitive to and that you, that you feel, that you experience when you engage with, uh, with this kind of work. Now, the transferring of those things to digital media to, for mass reproduction, it's, different. It's, it's a bit different, but it also, it's not like you're saying, the posters are not the same as the real thing. If you actually ever get a chance to see a manuscript, a handwritten Quran manuscript up close, yeah. there's, a, there's a presence there. That you get an echo of that in the, in the print, but it's not the same thing. And every, most people, I think, know this. That's why these you know, Picasso works sell for millions of dollars and the reproduction you can get on twenty dollars you know for twenty dollars on Amazon yeah. something. So there there is What's uh, the difference uh, between seeing you here and seeing a photograph of exactly. one's yeah. different. Let's go to the next question. Go ahead. Well it actually leads off this one. I think at the top level of art, a trained artist, trained digital person, the people are actually going back to technical tools like Wacom tables and us that allow you to do hand art, but in ways you never can do with an actual hand piece of ink. There are levels of control that you conceptualize and may want to do that you just can't do it by physical hand. And that's where true artists combine with great tools like all through the Muslim technological growth 
has allowed people to push the edge of what we could do artistically. So I think there's clear and sharp in everything. But at the end of the day is, the question is, and this is a question I want to ask is, where are we going to design and come up with the conceptual aesthetic, or aesthetic we talked about earlier, for art in the context of the societies we're coming out of and what their contribution to the internal Muslim communities and the world is in our architecture, in our design? Because most of the people are consuming audio where they're listening on their phone. So there's going to be some fundamental changes in things you do on how you present that to them. Because they don't have bookstores anymore a lot of times. And they may not afford it. They can get it on their phone for free. So I wanted to know if there's some conceptual, just like when the new schools of painting and others came up, and there was a, letter, a level of these are the conceptual um, things that we value and what new things we're bringing to the artistic world that others don't. And that's the question, really, for people who work in art and build the artifacts like buildings and art and books and digital and movies and whatever want to really have that discussion. That's the discussion I'd like to ask, even for write books, how the format changes now that most people are listening to audiobooks. What can calligraphy, I mean, recitation and things like art in an audio book change the format to be able to really impactful on the heart? So that's the question I want to ask. You want to try that? Um, so I, I don't think we actually need to invent an aesthetic. The principles are already there. They're implicit in the works of Islamic art from various, uh, of Islamic civilization. They've been around uh, for centuries. Um, they've, they're now starting to be explicitly articulated in works on Islamic art, so if anyone's interested, I'd recommend Sayyid Hossein Nasser's a great uh, book, Islamic Art and Spirituality, where you can find a lot of the, uh, the principles uh, to this discussed in you know, discursive uh, detail, and it's really a matter of applying these uh, kind of timeless universal principles to new contexts and new spaces and new times. And so as a result, it's necessarily going to look different in America. Uh, in, in the Americas than it, than it would in West Africa or in Egypt. And it's going to look different in West Africa today than it did 400 years ago. That's tradition. Tradition is not some dead thing that stays the same. It's like a branch that grows. It, 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 it's constantly changing uh, and evolving, but it's still connected to the root, and it never abandons those, those eternal principles. And so I think the principles are there, and they're there for... Uh, it, then, they're accessible to people who, who want to learn uh, from them and, and learn them. The question is then becomes, and this is for the artists, how to then apply those principles to these new contexts. Even new, completely new platforms, like you said, on phones. People now experience art and read things on phones, and that's very different from a book. And a book is very different from hearing something. And so part of the genius, I think, of the Islamic artistic traditions was basically translating these fundamental realities of the Islamic worldview of the Islamic revelation into these different media and into different places and times. You have the chronic recitation, you have beautiful calligraphy, you have architecture that changes everywhere it goes, but it's still based on some very fundamental uh, principles which are perceivable in, in the Quran. And so that's, I think, the challenge for artists in really uh, around the world, um, not, just, not just in uh, North America. Go ahead. First of all, this has been a wonderful afternoon listening to everything you're sharing. Uh, I love the way you articulated the spiritual um, in that sense and then with calligraphy and architecture, all of which interests me very much. Um, I think in, in looking at traditional Islamic art, architecture, calligraphy, uh, and, and other art forms, um, stained glass windows and so on, there seems to be a sense of an Islamic uh, concept of a wholeness and what you see nowadays is people who are trying, and I'll give a couple of examples, so I want to comment on that. <clears throat> well, let me say, going into the traditional masjid, you feel that serenity. You feel it, and I've felt it in Cairo, in Morocco, in India, in Uzbekistan, and many times in Turkey, where they have the most incredible azan. But what I'm saying, um, someone sent an email some time ago of a mosque somebody designed Obviously, he was an architect, but I think his ego was in it, and I think this is one of the things I want to say. The traditional Islamic art is, is fisabilullah. It is not to put your ego on it. Like Mimar Sinan, we know he did the most incredible uh, construction or designing of masjids all over Turkey, or jamias, um, but his ego isn't there. And uh, this one particular masjid, maybe you're familiar with, I don't recall where it even is, uh, it's concrete, um, the, the mehrab that's kind of missing, and instead there's this big round stone. 
and it's supposed to kind of make you think of Allah. And I said, actually, it makes me think of an idol uh, because it's stone, <laughs> which if we carve it, it would be an idol of whichever part of the world we're talking about. Um, and, and it seems to me that there's a disconnect very often nowadays with people who don't really know who they are. And I think the Sufi tradition, if it's revived, people will get that spiritual sense and that wholeness. So if some, if, you know, please comment. Any of you want to take a shot at that? Well, I think I sort of said it earlier, right, that when you see these old, very tranquil places you've mentioned, like mosques, they were different people who built these things. The way it was put together was different. Now when you're building a mosque, it's so complicated. You've got the mosque committee, you've got the architect, you've got the construction, you've got the project manager, you've got the planning, you've got the um, this health and safety. And of course, they all Community. fight. And, and, and what happens now, of course, also is that in fact, you know, mosques create division in communities, not, not uni unify them. It's happened in England. You get four mosques on the same road, sort of 20 feet from each other. Because of the way it's happened, the process, which I think we were saying has been lost in things, is so important. You know, the way people, in other words, people have to sort of, what people can do together is actually much more uh, productive than what one person can do himself. The problem with architects is that they think they rule the world. I know, I've been one. <laughs> And they, how, no, how? no, but I'm like Frank Lloyd Wright, or Frank Lloyd Wrong, as they used to call him. <laughs> they, he was, uh, um, I would, there's a civic trust, a civic centre in San Marino, I visited with Shaka. I mean, he designed everything right down to the doorknobs. This is kind of obsessive, you know. The, 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 the things I've really enjoyed to design in, in the past have been, you looked, at, it was a Mexican builder, and I said, look, there's a fountain, you should build the fountain. I'm not going to tell you what to do. And he did a beautiful job, because he was proud of what he did. If I had been designing, you know, like Victorian architects, like Pugin or um, these people, they would have designed every single bit and said, you do what I tell you to do. And so the architect was kind of the Freemasonic god. And, you, you know, you, you, and I think that's what dis has destroyed it all. And you're absolutely right. It's the ego of the architect has got in there. And it's... And it's now, you're working, you're working on the Cambridge Mosque. Uh, how's that going? Uh, I, it's, being, it's being built. Unfortunately, the architect died. Yeah, David Marks. I, I met him when it was just start, starting, and um, he's a very, very, very nice man. But you know, he, he had also designed the London Eye, which is this giant Catherine wheel by the Houses of Parliament. Right, so right. when I when they won a, they won the competition, I was slightly nervous. I thought it, it would be like kind of fun palace, you know. <laughs> and the, the, but um, it's gone through it's gone through stages. The thing is, that the man behind it, who's you know uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, Doctor Winter. Yeah. You know, he's he has so much opposition to it, you know I mean? These things create real political problems, but he's so completely determined and just carries it through. Uh, it's gonna be interesting, it's a kind of eco-mosque, it's not a traditional, there is a, it's like a, a derogatory, you could say, it looks like a telephone exchange with, an, uh, with a dome on the top, but actually, no, it, it's gonna be something quite different. It's been thought about, it, it's things he went through a very, very careful consultation process with the community. Right. And after a time, the, the locals realized, actually, it's gonna put up the value of their houses. You've got the city council behind it, even though there were the, 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 the you know, the, the right wing, they pr protested, but there were more people come out and defended it. Um, it's... Is it going it's, to be it's, a, it's, 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 it's unusual, you know. I, 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 is it going to be a traditional It's No, it's sort of, mask. sort of traditional. It's like a, it's like a, basically a box, but it has these beautiful um, spruce uh, columns splaying out, and, and, and it's, it's kind of unusual. But I, you know, he's, Abdul King is very sincere, and he's, so, something good will come out of it, I'm sure of that. Inshallah. Can I just say Abdul. one thing should about... should be ready next year, by the way. Oh, good. Inshallah. These Inshallah. things take long... They always take a long time. They have to take a long time. But I just want to say one thing, because we're talking about mosque spaces, and probably everyone will hate me. But um, <laughs> as a woman, you know, I've been to some amazing, beautiful mosques yeah. in this world, in my travels. But I've also spent some time praying in like a little box with fluorescent lights, yeah. you know, where I can't even hear the imam. Mm. And I just want to speak up that we need mosque spaces since we're, you know, we are, I mean, I hate to say it, but we're sort of on this uh, riding the crest of a big wave of Islam slowly becoming established in North America, let's mm. say, or, you know, I mean, there is a wave and here we all are. 
so I guess we're part of it. I, but I just have to say, is like I've prayed in one too many mosques like that, where we're completely separated from the person who's reciting, who's leading the prayers, where there's ugly clocks and ugly fans and plastic walls and screaming children, and just, I have to speak up uh, for all, everybody in the community, that this doesn't lead anyone to grace or baraka. Yep. And it's I just, very common. I, <laughs> I just, Thank I just, <laughs> I just wonder, you know, that one of the problems is that the uh, community where they're building a mosque are very rarely involved in the construction of the mosque. And then I've been involved in a few places where the people actually painted the walls. Like in Spain, the women actually paint the houses. You mm -hmm. know, if, if, the, if the women in this mosque had been involved in the mosque in, in, in doing it, which they weren't, they would have had a say. Oh, because the, they were put in a room yeah, and, downstairs and I, in the basement. I, I suggested this to Dr. Wenter. I said, why don't the people in Cambridge come and help. He said, unfortunately, health and safety prohibits it. You know, yeah. so you're trapped. It's yeah. the planners, it's, it's this and that. And, yeah. and, and until you get to sort of like West Africa, right. and there's no one gonna come there, you can do what you like. Right. So I, I just wanted to add, I completely agree with uh, what you, I mean, I'm not even sure if it was a question, but it's just a, a correct statement uh, that uh, yes, um, I think the South and other traditions of Islamic esotericism and spirituality are essential to this because those are the traditions that allow you access to the realities that are uh, figured, represented, manifest in the Islamic arts. <coughs> and I, I think um, a part of, uh, you could have a community come together and work together and make something that's nonsense. So they say like what a camel is a horse made by a committee. You know, that, that it's, it's, uh, you can have, it, it, there's more, the, the form is, is very important and traditional forms do evolve over time and adapt to different circumstances. And, but, there, but there's a form, and the form is very important. And when you experience, bar you can experience baraka through the form. The form can help uh, uh, accentuate the experience of baraka. And you can experience baraka in spite of the, the ugly form. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can be in a place, an ugly mosque, and it can be wonderful there because of the people there. Mm -hmm. um, but as you said, often, way far too often, and in many places increasingly, on commons. I know mosques in places uh, in West Africa, let's say, where the, the back of the mosque was always for women and it had all kinds of nice things. And because populations increased, the women are now pushed out. There's no, there's no, there wasn't an official women's section, it was just women always prayed in the back. Um, and now the women are being pushed out and they're pushed into these dirty spaces. Um, and you, you don't get this experience of, of grace and it's, it's horrible, let, let alone what's going on in, in, in the Haram or in Medina what the women who want to go visit the Prophet or Islam, or I've, go on, I've go been on, one of yeah, them. or what, what they have to go through yes. is, is, is what horrible. What we have to go through. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a woman, so I, so <laughs> but, what, but. What, um, what, what women have to go through um, in, 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 in the Haram, I mean, the Prophet said the three things that were made lovable to him, women, prayer, and perfume, and look at the way women are being treated there. It's, it's, a, real, it's a real shame on, is it on all of us. Is it that men just don't have a kind of empathy with what, how women really see things? Well, this I, I think on, on the deepest level, it's a, on the, the deepest level, it, there's a, a mis, an, a, an, uh, not understanding and not appreciating Jamal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. At, at oh, yeah, the yeah. deepest level, it's all Jalal. Yeah. It's all rigor, yeah. it's all harsh, it's, it's all, male. and it, it's all hyper toxic masculine. Yeah, and it, so it manifests that, that fundamental error and misconception manifests itself at all levels, ideologically, socially, um, How many art women forms. sit on mosque committees, for instance? Have you been interested in statistics? I don't know. Um, I don't know. But I do know that men, you know, in each one of us, we have the Jamal and the Jalal. And each one of us need to have a balance, right? You know, maybe women have more Jamal, but a lot of men are denying the beauty, the appreciation of beauty, because it's not, you know, macho or something. And so, I mean, I, I honestly, in my heart of hearts, believe that this kind of division between men and women is actually contributing to a lot of the ugliness. Do you mean in mosques? In mosques yeah. and, you know, lack of appreciation of a lot of beauty in Islam. Um, let me, uh, Haroon, is there any more questions from online before we continue here? Yes, thank you for asking. Um, someone has asked, I think her name is Khadija. Yes, Khadija asks, ask, actually this is Sister Khadija Harsolia who just spoke here uh, a week ago, alhamdulillah. She asks, do you think there is any form of Islamic art that can be self-taught? 
Self-taught. Well, what I, what I want to say is one of the aspects I think that makes art Islamic is the fact that it, it passes, it's a, it has an isnad, it has a chain of transmission from master to student. I think this is probably one of the defined. So you get an ijaza. Now, your work may not ever be as good as your teachers. You know, in some cases, teachers work is worse than the students. I mean, what you want, like a parent, is your student to excel and exceed you. So I think that's a very, um, I mean, even if it's middle, uh, me medium. Like I met my teacher, my calligraphy teacher, and then I worked through the mail with him, and then I visited him when I could. But there's other forms, I mean, that's true for calligraphy, the jazz idea and all of that, but other forms of like, Poetry and music well, and architecture, don't you don't think, get that, right? I don't actually think anything is ever self-taught. Yeah. No, nothing is ever sweet. You didn't learn language by yourself. You didn't learn to ride a bike by yourself. Even these, you, if you learn anything, you take in things from your outside surroundings, and then maybe you do something new or different you with them. You practice by and, yourself. And you, and you, may, you may practice by yourself, <laughs> but I, I don't, uh, what, what, have, what has anyone ever learned completely like on saying, his or could, her own? Could someone self-teach? Self no, it's long. Like, do people actually say Stop the shahada in yeah. isolation? No, because it's always yeah. been hand to hand. And I mean, you I have you have the example of like let's say Hayab and Yaktan, these thought experiments where you know you put right. someone on a, right. on, a, on a desert island, but none of us are in that situation. No. Given that we're not in that situation and we're social creatures, we live in in societies, we mm -hmm. see things around us. So I don't think anything is self-taught. So given that fact, then it becomes what is the best way to learn something, given the conditions uh, in, in which you find yourself. And that's often to find a teacher, and if you don't have a teacher, to find the best examples of something and spend lots of time contemplating it and trying to imitate it. And if you don't know what the best examples are, find someone who has good taste, who can tell you what the best examples are and what you should, what you should, what you should look at. And like what I always say about calligraphy is that nobody is born doing this. People get frustrated, they take one class, oh, I can't do it, I'm terrible. And it's like nobody comes out of the womb with this stuff. Everybody is learning it. Did you have a... Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm just going to say that it got to my comment. I was just going to make a comment about transmission and how important that is. And you haven't really touched on it until right now. But I think that that's the element that is absolutely needed in all of this, in our dean and everything. Can I and say it, something about that? Or am I cutting you let, off? Let me just finish what I'm saying or I'll forget it. <laughs> Um, if you don't follow the transmission, if you are self-taught, I mean, look at Islam now. We have Muslims out there, as they say they're Muslims, representing Islam in the most atrocious ways. And it's because people do not follow the traditions of our imams anymore. You've got people who are like journalists who are basically re-questioning re things that people, uh, Muslims have accepted for centuries. And, and, and the transmission has been broken. And so I believe that that's why you get cucumbers and gherkins growing up in London, because these guys have broken away from the tradition of architects. It's a disconnect, yeah. It's a disconnect, and, and this is something that we really need to look at, because this is what's wrong with our dean at the minute. Well, not the dean, but how it's being represented. You know, I just, that was my comment. Can I just say one thing that Mohammed Zakaria always says, um, which really hits me and is very powerful. He just said, Calligraphy, and I mean it could be any of these arts, is about love, ultimately. And the thing is, is that I could probably speak about that for an hour. You know, it just sounds like a huge statement, but, but there's love between letters. Mm -hmm. There's love of your pen. There's love of your teacher. There's love from your teacher. There's love of a community. Mm -hmm. It's, I mean, he just makes these sweeping statements, and it's just true. It's about love, and without that love, that's the, that's the connection and the attachment it's that the, we have. The highest element of Jamal of beauty is love. Right. And that's, you know. What, it's a connection. Yeah. Anyway, thank you for coming. I know this has been really hard for you guys. Abdul has been dosing himself full of medicine. For what? <laughs> <laughs> He's a little sick, Abdul so yeah. got thank, thank you so much. I'm fine. Um, we're going to have time for one or two questions more. Harun, let's take one and then we'll take one from here. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so let me try to combine these uh, two questions from online into one, if I could. Uh, Sister Nahid asks, how important would it be to introduce calligraphy to an Islamic school curriculum? In which ways could it develop cognition 
and could it also develop a closer connection to our spiritual side? And then also we have Brother Peter Gould, who a lot of the panelists know. He's asking for just general advice for aspiring Muslim designers and creative professionals from our panels. Um, let me just say before we they answer that question that the Peter Gold question, we will um, uh, answer that as a wrap-up question because that is something I wanted to ask them about. But let's take the question of calligraphy and talking Shall about I curriculum in school. Um, I mean, there's a few very practical things to keep in mind. Of course, it would be wonderful to have calligraphy a part of a curriculum mm -hmm. in any school. Children under the age of 10 in general don't have you know, the right fine motor skills. This is just general education um, knowledge. Um, it, it's, it's a service, it's not a product. You were saying, you know, it's, it's not something that can be consumed. I've been through this, you know, considered this with some people who wanted to produce like a calligraphy kit. And ultimately my conclusion is that I need to come or somebody does, you know, just as me because I'm the one who's there. Um, and, and do an introduction, and then maybe people can do it on their own students. I would say middle school, high school, it would be a great part of a curriculum, and in order to do it well, you need a teacher, and that needs to be, you need like four classes, four periods a week of this, not just like once a year or a workshop here and there. Um, I think it's a great idea, and I think, again, because you're using your hand, it's engaging your whole body, it's bringing um, a richness to it, it's a, an awakening our spatial understanding, which people tend to lose. I mean, some kids, some people are just prone to not having a lot of spatial awareness. Um, proprioception, I think, is the word for that. Um, which can help, you know, students learn differently, you know, there's a lot of different ways to learn. I once had somebody who, if I told them, they were an oral learner, if I told them how to move their pen, they could work well. So it's something that should be a part of every curriculum, but we need to train more calligraphers. So people should come to New York and study with me or go to Turkey better. There are much better calligrapher teachers than me in Turkey. Okay, let's get a last question. Mohammed, are you ready? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry, I'm tall. So, uh, I'm a bit of a rock and roller metal aficionado, and uh, I'm actually working on an album right now that is uh, a mixture of the Diwan of Sheikh Mohammed ibn al Habib and in the Arabic language, put, and the melodies from that Diwan that are sung in Morocco and Algeria, um, and I'm actually translating that into kind of a metal sound. Um, so, so I'm kind of curious about um, what you think, if you think there's an amalgam, there can be an amalgamation of Islamic and Western ideals of beauty in art. And in other words, uh, can Ihsan and the beauty of Islam be channeled through modern Western artistic expressions? That's kind of for everybody. Go ahead, you should take it. Um, uh, I would say what you're trying to do is pretty impossible. I think what you have to try and do is forget the Diwan Ibn Habib, it's fine. That's, what you have to do is find what you can say about your experience and find, make that something beautiful out of that and then put music to that. I would, I would say that's the way to go. I think trying to take stuff which is from an Arabic, and it, it, the, the Diwan is, has got very, very high, um, high level content. And I was told by someone in Morocco that you know, a lot of people who probably sing it don't understand some of the, 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 the sophisticated content, but by singing it, it actually, they, they taste it. Mm -hmm. They say that you know, if, you, if you recite the poetry of a poet, the poet's kind of, he, he's with you, he's, he manifests in some way. But trying to, it's mixing sort of chalk and cheese to take something which is sort of classical Arabic, Qasaid, uh, and put sort of rock and roll to it, it's just, it's counterintuitive in some way. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying rock and roll isn't the way to go because you could do something with electric guitar and it could be quite profound, but I don't think it's going to be taking something literally and translating it. I, I'd be interested in what you have to say about your experience with life, reality, your, and explore that. You know, that's my only, only thing I can say to that. 
Chalk and cheese, that's a good expression. I never heard that before. It's Oil English, and water English is what we say around here. There's a lot of chalk and a lot of cheese. Why can't really? <laughs> okay, See, I would say that, you know, you don't know where this is going to take you. I mean, I'm not a musician. And it might be worth your time experimenting and seeing what happens because maybe it will be pulled, something will come out. Like this could be a transformational experience and maybe you should try it. I would uh, disagree. Um, I, as a musician uh, myself, most fusion albums, if you know, most fusion albums are famously terrible. And they're terrible because, terrible? terrible. Most fusion albums we disagree. are, are uh, well, I think most, most fusion albums are... When you say fusion, are you talking about... Anything, jazz, jazz fusion, Kowali, flamenco fusion, all these the different things. The flamenco fusion is terrible, Be you know, Because, uh, so these, these, these particular forms are, are particular forms. It's not the only way to do something, but it's a particular way to do something. Mm. And generally, when you fuse it with another form, what you get is a watered-down version of both, which is not as good as either of them... It's chalk and cheese. Uh, on, ...on their own. Yeah, I guess chalk and cheese, I'm not familiar with that, but it sounds right. It doesn't sound like it'd be nice to eat chalk and cheese together. <laughs> um, so what, uh, there are a few cases where it does work. Yeah, you never know. There's always the exception. You there's, there's, never there's, there's know. The, well, there's the exception. You never, you never know what you're going to find in a garbage dump, but you, don't go, right. but you don't go there looking for diamonds. Um, we, so you, you, listen, you, historically, we tr we've tried some of these things, believe you me. Yeah. We did, a, we did this, the, the, this tour with Richard Thompson in the, in the late 70s. It was known as the Sufi tour. Mm. And it, it was very difficult, actually. There was a few, there was, we did a Romy thing called I'm a Bird in God's Garden, which worked quite well, actually. Because, you know, I'm a bird in God's garden, and I did not belong in this dusty mm. world. It kind of worked. It sounded like Hank, Hank Williams. Right. If, you could, if you could bring the mic closer to your mouth. Oh, sorry. Uh, shall I start again? <laughs> Um, in the um, 1970s, I, uh, we were on this tour with Richard Thompson, and it was known as the Sufi tour, because a lot of the songs had, he had taken uh, things from uh, sort of Sufi poetry and put them in a kind of rock format. Some of it was a bit difficult, actually, it didn't work, but some of it was actually pretty good. And there was this, actually uh, and one, one thing was, was, uh, was a bird in God's garden, which was actually like, sounded like Hank Williams, but it was actually, it kind of it gelled. And there's another one called, um, what was it called? Um, the Madness of Love, which was Can actually... Can you sing one of them? Well, but The Madness of Love was actually based on an Algerian Qasida tune, which was like, um, Ya, you and I touch, Ya Rijal Allah, Ah, Ya Rijal Allah. The Algerians had a lot of very good, yeah. funky tunes. So I, but, uh, but when Richard put music to it, he said, That is the madness of love. Da. So in a way, it left its... It became an English song, right. and that's the secret. You've got to make it completely English. So, if you think it's Arabic in the background... You... What, what I wanted to say, so in doing a kind of fusion project, you set a very, very high bar for yourself because yeah. there's so many ways Why that... Why not? There are so many, yeah. th there are so many ways that it, that it can go wrong, and so it's, it's something that takes... Uh, it's going to require a lot of uh, great skill um, and, and insight. Yeah. Um, and you could learn a lot by making mistakes. Well, the, the interesting thing is since I've taken, undertaken this project, I've actually been memorizing as I've been going along the, the, the entire D1, so that's been beneficial oh for God, me. Yeah. Uh, Transformation. Exactly. Uh, but uh, one, one, of the, one of the kind of deeper points of the question is, uh, is it possible not necessarily uh, to to create something for the Muslim community, but to channel Ihsan and Islamic uh, ideals of beauty through Western music or Western artistic expression. So uh, that, there's kind of two, two uh, dimensions here. So one is like, if you learn to play Bach, and you learn to play Bach really, really well, like Bach Chacon or something like that, it's an amazing piece. And you learn to play it, let's say, on your electric guitar, because you can do, it's amazing. And that's Ihsan, in a certain sense, it's beauty, it's excellence, but it's a different form of Ihsan, right? So you could, uh, and Muslims have been adopting all kinds, Kowali, they use this harmonium, it's not a traditional Islamic instrument, violins, people use, you can, you can channel, uh, but then in channeling it through a Western, quote unquote, Western form, I don't really like the category Western, because like, what's more West than Senegal? Um, <laughs> but, uh, or here, um, but uh, then it's, it's no longer a Western form, it becomes an Islamic form. You can make it an Islamic form. So, I mean, the guitar is descended from Islamic, Islamic het instruments. That are, you can make the guitar, you can play Islamic music on, on, on the guitar. You can use the, the maqams on the guitar. You can use these traditions and understandings 
of uh, what music is and how it works. But I think in, in order to do something like this well, you either need to know uh, an Islamic tradition of music mm. very well, um, or you need to know the, the principles of Islamic music very well. And those two things are rarely ever separated. Usually if you know the principles, you know the application. Um, and if you know the application, you might not know the principles explicitly, but you know them implicitly. You know what sounds right and what, what, what doesn't sound right. Um, so that my advice is if you go forward with this project, listen to uh, a lot of um, how the Diwan is done. And then if there are some corollaries to the kind of guitar style that you're doing, like setar, uh, either sitar Indian or sitar Persian, they're using metallic strings and there's a kind of metallic sound uh, there as well to find a kind of traditional analog for that and kind of un try to get a sense of, or tambour, um, try to get a sense of what they're doing uh, with it and how that music works and what it does to, to the soul. And so you can try to do something, um, communicate some of the beauties of, of uh, the Islamic revelation and these haqqaiq in, in your music. Okay, we need to uh, wrap this up soon, so I'm going to ask <clears throat> um, all of our panelists to do a sort of a closing statement, but in the form of a question. This is the question that I think Peter Gold asked. Um, I'm going to put my own spin on it, but basically, uh, what advice would you all have for somebody who wants to, for designers especially, but also anybody who wants to do traditional art, and uh, for, you know, sort of budding artists or even for lay people about why, <coughs> uh, how to go about doing that. Uh, some of you mentioned this earlier, but how do, how do you go about learning and doing, practicing traditional arts? What do you need to do to, what's your one piece of advice for people who are interested in doing traditional arts, Islamic arts? While you think about that, I'm going to give you 30 seconds. I'm going to make a 30 second pitch to the audience. I'm going to... Um, ask all of you that this is, uh, you know, we do this print version of Renovai Show, we do a website, we do events like this, we want to do more of these. Uh, we think we've sort of uh, arrived at a place where actually there's a thirst for all of these things out there and we're trying to meet that. So if you like Renovai Show, if you like our events, if you like the website we've created, we're doing, posting a lot of videos on there, interviews with scholars, this event itself will be posted on there as well. Uh, then please take a minute to make a gift to Zaytuna College because that's what's going to get, get us the resources. All of these things take a lot of resources to put together. And so think about doing that. Um, it's a very simple way to make a donation. You can go onto our website. And for those watching online, um, renovatio.zaytuna.edu, R-E-N-O-V-A-T-I-O.zaytuna.edu. Click on the donate button. Make a donation. Now let's get back to closing statements from all of you about ad your advice. Okay, uh, advice, uh, spend a lot of time in nature, in, in, in virgin nature. Spend a lot of time with the Quran, spend a lot of time doing dhikr, because that's where all of this comes from. Uh, and then uh, to try to create an ambiance around yourself of traditional Islamic arts. So your home, uh, when you can, even your clothes, um, the surrounding yourself with that, kind of putting yourself on a diet of uh, good Islamic art and good art in, in, in general can be incredibly uh, beneficial uh, for whatever it is that you want to do. And the best thing, if you can, is find a master with, with whom you can uh, study and learn. But in the absence of a master, find the best examples of whatever it is you're, you're seeking to learn about. Um, uh, whether it's calligraphy, and even if you're not specifically learning calligraphy, I, I, I think looking at beautiful pieces of calligraphy, there's a music to them, uh, can, make you a better, uh, can make you a better musician, uh, a, a better poet. But surrounding yourself with either the direct beauty of, of nature, uh, immersing yourself in the Quran and dhikr, um, and the beauty of the Islamic arts is, is the way to go. Aisha. So I would say the most important thing is to find somebody, I wouldn't even say a master. There aren't too many masters here. I mean, if you can find a master, that's great. If you can find someone who's just a little further than you on the path, whatever it is, or a teacher of music or anything, someone who's knowledgeable, um, of course, look at nature all the time. Look at the sky. If I could just tell people, look at the sky. That's a wonderful thing. The other thing, I have to say, in my experience as a teacher, is to accept that unexpected things can happen on the, the path of at least the calligrapher. It may be harder than you expect. Um, you may have to practice more. Um, 
than you would have expected, but it's really worth it. There's a reward and also don't be afraid to make mistakes and don't be afraid to experiment. Um, and that's my advice. My advice is, um, you ha because everybody has different gifts, people are given different gifts, you have to find out what you can do well. Yes. Aristotle said that the secret of happiness is find something that you're good at and do it really well. And, I, and, and be, you maybe want to be a calligrapher, a, um, a singer, a, 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 a chef even, or, or a bricklayer, or, or you could clean drains, but do it, do it really well and be the best drain cleaner. <laughs> um, and that's the way, and, and then do it with love. Do it with a lot of love, because that's passionately love what you're doing. And some of these calligraphers of the, of the past, they used to sort of, their, their hands were cut off and they'd write with the blood. It was just, yeah, it's true, it's, yeah. We're crazy. We <laughs> calligraphers are crazy lots, yeah. Um, then you get results. Something, something will happen. You know, I sp I'm speaking from experience actually. It's and uh, it's something I think um, Abd Hakim said once that he said actually in Islam the core emotion and this is something that Muslims don't often talk about. The core emotion of Islam is love itself. And even Charles Dickens said, "Love makes the world go round." It wasn't Shakespeare. It was Charles Dickens, <laughs> and it love <laughs> makes the world go round. So, as 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 every American. Uh, uh, Luther Van Joss would say to his audience, I love you, Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, please join me in giving a round of applause for our, audience, for our guests. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, don't forget to read the articles and watch the videos online. And for those who are looking for Maghrib prayer, we'll be praying downstairs after this. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Mm -hmm.